Hello and welcome to Soothing Pond's Sleep Stories. My name is Arif, and tonight I will be your guide as we embark on a calming train journey through the enchanting scenery of the late Cretaceous period. We will safely ride alongside dinosaurs as they roam the wild and wonderful landscape. We will learn about their habits, biology, and fossils, all the while while we enjoy the comforts of our lush and fabulous train compartment. Before we begin, however, let us take a moment to relax and find comfort in the place that we are in here and now. Close your eyes and allow your body to sink into the mattress beneath you. Here and now, there are no obligations, there are no responsibilities. By simply closing your eyes and listening to the sound of my voice, you are slowly relaxing and providing your body and mind with the rest and nourishment that they need. Sleep will come in due time, but know that your mind and body are already on a soothing journey of peace and relaxation. Allow your body to sink more and more into the mattress beneath you, really feeling the comfort and support of the bed. Notice how it cradles your body and notice the parts of your body that are in contact with the bed. Your legs, arms, your torso, your head as it presses into the soft pillow or the mattress itself. For a moment, let us imagine that you're not in your room. Instead, you find yourself somewhere else entirely. Somewhere that is beautiful and vibrant and relaxing. You're deep within a peaceful jungle, miles and miles away from society, where you can just unwind and watch the entirely unique world around you breathe and move. The jungle is thick and lush, with an abundance of plants that stretch as far as the eye can see. It's the middle of the day, and the sun is high and reaching its crest in the baby blue sky overhead. You can only see slivers of the blue popping in between slits in the leafy canopy. Slivers that contrast beautifully against the green branches in the canopy, making them look like islands floating on a tranquil turquoise sea. The branches overhead sway and dance in the light breeze, a breeze that is fragrant with aromas that you have never smelled before. They are earthy and fresh, like soil and loam and ferns, mixed with a sweet fragrance of flowers that invoke its ethereal beauty and mystery. You breathe it in as it laces through the forest, somehow becoming more and more invigorating with every deep breath you drink in. The flowers and trees around you are familiar, 
but just a bit different than the plants you'd expect to find in rainforests around the world. There are endless oceans of fern blanketing the clearing. The ferns sway with every gust of wind, moving in unison like waves moving across the sea. Their rippling in the breeze makes the whole space feel as though it's alive, breathing in harmony with you and letting go to the motions of the blowing wind. Towering over the ferns are brilliant conifers and palms. You lean against one of the palm trees and glide down to the ground, using it as a support. The plush grass cushions your landing, inviting you to truly relax. Though the clearing is blanketed in ferns, there is something peculiar in front of you. There's a tiny blue fern all by itself in the grass that is curled up into itself in a spiral. You lean forward to get a closer look at the miraculous little plant. And as you do, you take a deep breath in. As you breathe in, the fern slowly unfurls. And as you breathe out, letting out that long exhale, the bright blue fern curls back into itself. You breathe in, watching as the fern unfurls bit by bit shaking its leaves free. And then you exhale, watching as the fern curls back into itself in a new, relaxed state. You breathe in deeply, feeling the cool, refreshing air fill your lungs as the fern unfurls and goes free. Then you exhale as the fern does, slowly relaxing back into a natural resting position. For quite some time, you sit and watch the unique, stunning blue fern move with the rhythm of your breath. You become aware that at any point, you can return to the image of the little fern moving alongside you, encouraging you to slow down and breathe with it. You lean back and relax against the tree. Even with your eyes closed, you can see the hypnotic movements of that fern in your mind, furling and unfurling, finding comfort and expanding beyond itself. With your eyes closed, you breathe in the fresh air around you. You can taste the sweet and fresh plants that you can't name and the damp, rain-soaked soil around you. The scenery around you is a landscape of abundance with plants that have been nourished, like you have, by journeying to this place. Now that we have taken the time to unwind and find peace and comfort in the place that we are in, here and now. Let us begin our sleepy, soothing, educational journey to the wild and wonderful world 
of the late Cretaceous period. Although your eyes are closed, you already have some idea of where you are. You can feel a soft, gentle drizzle washing over your face and your hands. You can feel each droplet of water as it lands on your skin and rolls off, landing softly in the grass below your feet. Despite the rain, the air is warm and it is buzzing with humidity. You can hear trees and leaves rustling all around you in the breeze as the rain dances over them as well. But the most beautiful sound of all is the sound of water tumbling over rocks and around river bends. The river before you is certainly not a mighty one. But as you open your eyes, you can see how beautiful it is. You are deep within the rainforest, but not the rainforests of the Amazon or Australia, no. These are the rainforests of the Pacific Northwest. Perhaps you are somewhere in Oregon, or Washington, or Vancouver, although things as trivial as borders don't seem to matter when you're in a place as magical and connected to nature as this is. There is beauty in the lushness of the rainforests that are found here. But there is also something about them that feels wild and prehistoric. Ferns blanket the mossy earth where old rocks and fossils are buried, waiting to be uncovered. Hundreds of different species of vines and climbing plants wind their way up ancient trees, striving to reach what little sunlight is streaming from the top, dozens of feet away. The forest is so thick that it's hard to see far ahead, and yet you feel safe and protected. Though you cannot see the whole forest, nor all of its hidden inhabitants. This notion does not bother you. You know there is beauty to be found in the unknown there, that there are mysteries to be discovered and ancient past to be uncovered. You take a step into the dense forest savoring the feeling of soft, rain-brushed leaves caressing your skin as you weave around tall trees and plants to try and get deeper into this rainforest. You continue treading, putting your hand in front of you to sweep the branches and leaves out of the way. There's a rhythm to it as you step, extend your hand, and sweep. A steady rhythm that makes it feel like you are wading through a sea of plants, gliding through them with ease. With each brush of your hand, the brilliant fragrance of the plants rises up and engulfs you. The ferns and other plants have a breathtaking mix of scents that wash over you in a wave, a refreshing mint aroma, a soothing cinnamon, an earthy and invigorating pine and cedar. With each wave, 
you seem to uncover a new layer of the scent and find yourself becoming more and more relaxed. But soon, your waiting is interrupted by something remarkable. For quite some time, you have seen nothing but the beautiful expanse of trees and plants before you. But now, you sweep plants aside and find yourself approaching a clearing in the center of this dense and wonderful forest. You step into the center of the clearing. Once again, the rain begins to fall over you, landing in delicate droplets on your hands, your face, your chest. They mix with the aroma of the plant oils on your skin, filling the air with an invigorating mix of scents and the unique smell of the rain itself. In the center of the clearing, there is a small wooden building, not something you would expect to see this far in the woods but even more peculiar. There are train tracks running just in front of the building. It takes you a moment to realize that you are looking at a rustic train station. The building itself has three worn sides atop a small raised platform. The roof of the train station is blanketed with a thick layer of moss that glistens with the heavy droplets of rain in a breathtaking way. It makes the whole train station appear as if it is glowing, and it makes your heart skip a beat simply by looking at it. You approach the train station it feels like you are floating in a dream, each footstep on the wet soil gentle and slow. You gaze around the clearing for a moment, wondering who else could possibly use this train station. Who was it built for? And what kind of trains would come to a place this remote? this far from society. What use did it have? You climb the old wooden steps of the train station. They creak with every step you take. Old soil and fallen leaves tumble off the planks as you climb up, leaving a cloud of dust and plants in your wake. The platform is simple, yet pleasantly colorful. There is a bench painted a vibrant mustard in the center of the platform, shielded beneath a strong section of the roof. Holes in the roof let bursts of rain tumble through the ceiling and soak the wood boards below giving the whole space an even more ethereal feeling. And as if the trained platform in the middle of the rainforest wasn't strange enough, the posters on the wall of the station are. There are posters of dinosaurs adorning the faded wooden walls of the platform. They are not childish renderings, nor modern ones. They look like they have been plucked from Victorian era books, scrawled on faded brown scrolls with precious ink and quill. There is information scrawled in cursive around the dinosaurs. 
describing where they are from and what their habits are. For a moment, you look over them, taking in every few words, because really, your mind is caught on why this place exists. Just as you finish reading the last line on one of the posters, there is a distinct rumbling in the distance of the forest. You stand still, listening intently as the rumble grows and grows. At first, you wonder if it is thunder in this otherwise gentle rainstorm. But when you turn, you notice smoke is rising from somewhere in the forest. And not just smoke from a fire, moving smoke, a plume of it that appears to be rising from a vehicle. A train emerges through the thick forest like magic, and my, is it a thing of beauty. It is an old steam train with a large iron grate on the front and intricate moldings and designs adorning its metalwork. That smoke rises from the front of the train as it chugs along the tracks, its bright red sides glistening in what little sun has managed to make its way through the thick clouds overhead. You turn and gaze at the train, shocked that it had emerged from seemingly nowhere to grace you with its presence out here. The train rumbles to a stop just before you at the end of the platform. It brings a gust of warm wind with it that rustles your warm coat and hair. You stand there for a moment, gazing up at the glowing, warm lights of the train windows. The train makes you feel safe and welcomed, even in the uncertainty surrounding its existence. You reach forward to knock on the door, eager to get some answers to the questions that you have. But just as your hand is about to reach the door, it opens. A kind-eyed man looks down at you with a smile. He is not dressed like a train conductor nor a train worker. He is dressed like an archaeologist or field worker of some kind. He pulls his hands out of the pockets of his khaki shorts and rolls up the long sleeves of his breathable hiking shirt. On his head, he wears a wide-brimmed hat that he surely uses to protect himself from the sun. He looks a lot like a character out of an archaeology movie, or perhaps a dinosaur movie. Ah, we were hoping you would be here. May I see your ticket, please? He asks his voice as warm and comforting as honey on a drizzly day. You smile up at the man with a bit of uncertainty and tell him that you don't have a train ticket, whatever train it may be. He smiles and chuckles to himself before he motions to your coat pocket and chimes. I believe if you check your pockets, you will find exactly what you need there. You reach into your pocket, and sure enough, you feel the smooth paper of a ticket 
in the palm of your hand. You pull the ticket out, unsure of how it got there, but mesmerized by the fact that it did. You turn it over in your hands to see, written plain as day and in soft black ink, the Cretaceous Express. Before you have a chance to ask any questions, the man in the hat takes the ticket from you with a gleeful smile. Wonderful, he exclaims. With a trained hand, he quickly snips the corner of your ticket with a hole puncher. Then, with an ostentatious air, he steps aside and motions for you to step onto the train. Welcome aboard. I have a feeling you are going to love it here. You walk past him, buzzing with anticipation for whatever ride you are about to embark on. On your way past, you notice his gilded name tag, which reads Ron, with a smiley face at the end. You turn into the main compartment of the train, and immediately you find yourself breathless in the best way possible. The train is absolutely stunning. The walls are made of thick, beautifully rich mahogany. The seats are upholstered in rich, deep red velvet that pops against the dark wood. The exterior walls consist of floor-to-ceiling glass windows. There are tables between the chairs that are intricately carved with designs you can't quite make out as you walk down the compartment to the seat listed on your ticket, 4E. You sit down in the comfortable seat and lean back, embracing the way your body sinks into the plush chair. Around you, there are a few other people they all give you a polite head nod of acknowledgement and a smile, welcoming you aboard this strange little train. Now closer to the table, you are able to make out the designs on it. They appear to be dinosaurs of all kinds, dinosaurs that are mixed in with tropical plants and ferns. You run your fingers over the carvings, appreciating the artistry and the obvious fondness for these creatures that is so noticeable in this wood. Just as your fingers leave the wood, the train begins to move. Everyone looks out of their windows in anticipation leaning up against the glass with smiles on their faces. To your surprise, Ron steps out into the aisle, adjusting his hat and drawing everyone's attention to himself. He gestures to both sides in greeting of everyone and cheerfully announces, Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cretaceous Express. I will be your guide as we take this long, wonderful journey into the past, to the late Cretaceous period. Rounds of applause echo from all sides of the train, but you hesitate unsure if Ron is being serious or not. Your question is answered only seconds later, 
when a shadow washes over the train car and a flash of light follows only moments later. When the light fades, you turn and look out at a landscape that is similar but somehow vastly different from our own. The plants look like primitive versions of modern ones. Ferns are king, stretching as far as the eye can see in this seemingly temperate climate. There are flowering plants peppering the light green and emerald grass. Flowers of red, orange, pink and yellow. There isn't a house or building or man-made structure anywhere in sight because they don't exist yet. Around you, there are a few trees that rise so tall they seem to brush the baby blue sky high overhead. The trees look similar to the ones you'd see in a forest today. Early versions of oak trees, magnolia trees, boxwood trees. There are a few tiny differences between them, but it is almost impossible to deny that they are related to one another. The land is vast, wild, and beautiful. Each flowering tree or plant you pass seems to be more beautiful than the last. Ron steps up and begins to tell you about the plants you are seeing and the magical world you are witnessing. The Cretaceous period was the longest period of the Mesozoic era. It started 145 million years ago and lasted until about 66 million years ago. Throughout the course of the Cretaceous period, there were dozens of fascinating, life-altering changes that took place on Earth. The continents began to drift away from each other. India detached from Africa and drifted in the direction of Asia. The Americas were gradually moving westward, causing the Atlantic Ocean to expand. In the Southern Hemisphere, Australia and Antarctica seem to have remained connected and began to drift away from Africa and South America. Europe was an island chain. The Cretaceous period was also a period of temperature fluctuations. While the climate was warmer than present, throughout the period a cooling trend is evident. The tropics became restricted to equatorial regions and northern latitudes experienced markedly more seasonal climatic conditions. This was also the time where flowering plants first appeared and began to spread across the landscape. Trees sprouted from the earth in much greater diversity, and by the end of this period, grass appeared. Turf on the soil strengthened it and made it more fertile, allowing for seeds and a larger biodiversity of not just plants, but mammals. Just as Ron finishes explaining this to you, he smiles and motions out the window, like this Repanomamus to the right here. You follow his gaze out the window and are shocked to see a strange creature bumbling through the foliage there. It is a fluffy, large mammal 
strikingly similar to a Tasmanian devil. Ron explains that this is Repinomamus, the largest known mammal of the Cretaceous period. We don't know a lot about them from fossils, but what we do know is that they were predators who were short and fairly clumsy. They weren't able to move quickly, so some scientists believe that they were mainly scavengers. They are also the only known mammal to have eaten dinosaurs. You watch the Repinomamus waddle its way through the underbrush, not even bothering to give your train the slightest glance. It appears to be sniffing the air, surely tracking something or looking for its next meal. It amazes you to see something that existed so long ago, walking through the world like any other creature would. But suddenly, the Repinomamus takes off into the brush, rushing with a bit more urgency. Ron smiles one more time as he looks out the window. And speaking of dinosaurs, it appears that we have our first one here, he chimes. The whole train car turns to look out the window, and what they see is one of the most recognizable dinosaurs to ever walk the earth. You know what it is before Ron says it, and the fact that you are seeing one floods your body with warmth. It's a Triceratops. It is a lone one, standing in a meadow to the side of the train. The wheels creak as the train comes to a steady rest on the tracks. You put your hands up on the glass of the window, mesmerized by the creature that is standing before you. It is nearly 30 feet long, much bigger than you ever could have imagined before seeing one in person. And despite its size and the three horns on its head, you feel safe near it. It has a visibly docile nature as it leans down to munch on cycads and ferns surrounding it. It moves and chews at a slow, steady pace, one that instills serenity and peace in the ever-present rhythm of life. Ron explains that the name Triceratops means three-horn face, but Triceratops didn't actually have three horns. They had two horns on the top of their head and a shard of keratin on the end of their nose which many people wrongly believe is a horn. The keratin shard would not have been useful in fighting, and some scientists believe their normal horns wouldn't be either. It is unknown what exactly Triceratops used their horns for, but someday scientists hope to figure it out. Triceratops are a frequently found fossil in the western United States and Canada, so new information is uncovered about them fairly often. You continue on from the Triceratops, watching over your shoulder as the train carries on. The Triceratops reaches over and grabs a palm frond eating it easily with its dozens of teeth. But it isn't long before you encounter another dinosaur. As the train chugs along the tracks, entering a thin forest full of trees that are similar to oak trees, Ron laughs and points up. You look up through the glass roof of the train, and the creature hovering over you takes your breath away. At first, you assume it's a Brachiosaurus, 
It completely towers over the train with a long, slender neck and a body similar to an elephant's. It nonchalantly grabs hold of leaves, taking off entire branches with ease. But Ron tells you all, it isn't a Brachiosaurus, because they were found in the Jurassic period. This is an Alamosaurus, a similar herbivore, which happens to be the largest dinosaur known to have lived in North America. It is a gentle giant that peacefully ate leaves, though little more is known about it aside from its diet. You watch in awe for quite some time as the Alamosaurus dines on leaves, eating an entire tree's worth in only a matter of minutes. It is a graceful creature, one that you cannot believe you have the privilege of watching. Slowly, the train continues on. Ron tells you that there will be more creatures on the horizon, but that for some time, you will just be driving through the forest. You turn on your side and cozy up as you gaze out the window. The trees passing by and the wild forests of the Cretaceous period look like something out of a painting. You feel at peace, comforted by Ron's knowledge and the beauty of the landscape. Ever so slowly, the rumble of the train and the steady rhythm of its motion lulls you closer and closer to sleep. You know that if anything comes, Ron will awaken you. But for now, you will drift off to sleep. I hope you have enjoyed this sleep story, and it has brought you a night of peaceful, restful sleep. Please, join me again tomorrow night for another sleep story. Until then, sweet dreams.